While there are few unifying factors in the current political climate, concern over the strength of our democracy is one expressed by all sides. Finding ways to make our democracy more resilient and responsive is the focus of tonight's event at the Jesse Ball DuPont Center in downtown Jacksonville. And to give us a preview, I'm joined now by two featured speakers, Will Brown, race, poverty, and inequality reporter at Jacksonville Today. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Ann. And Desmond Mead, president and executive director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Welcome, Desmond. Good morning, Ann. It's great to have you, Desmond. You were named one of Time's most 100 influential people of the year in 2019, but uh, still not everyone knows your story. Remind us a little bit about your background and ha how you came to voter activism. Yes, thank you so much for having me uh, this morning. I am just, I consider myself an ordinary guy who at one point in life was addicted to drugs and I found myself in and out of, of jail and prisons and and eventually homeless on the streets and, you know, through a series of traumatic events and to a point that led me to a point where I wanted to commit suicide, uh, I was able to rebound from that and get a substance abuse treatment and enroll myself in one of the local uh, colleges and universities and just committed myself to giving back to the community. And uh, the main area was around uh, restoring voting rights to people with previous felony convictions. and. And that's been my story, and, and we were successful in 2018 uh, when I led the effort to restore voting rights to approximately 1.4 million Floridians with previous felony conviction. We've spoken in the past, Desmond, and I know that that dark period in your life, it was almost um, kind of a metaphorical crossing over. I mean, you say you brought yourself to the point of, you know, considering suicide literally kind of at a railroad tracks, um, but you crossed the tracks, you went on to get your law degree, um, which was a remarkable accomplishment for somebody who'd had as many challenges. Um, the limits on being a former felon affected you in your desire to become a lawyer and also your desire to vote for your own wife when she decided to seek public office. Oh man, you remember that moment, man. Yeah, that was, that was a very uh, decisive moment in my life because even, you know, I've been, I was advocating for voting rights prior to my wife running for office, but it did not hit home uh, until she ran for office and, and I realized that, wow, I couldn't even vote for her. And so what that did was just put gasoline on a fire that was already burning. And it really caused me to amp it up, especially uh, coupling that with another story of an elderly man who, you know, was denied the right to vote because uh, eight years prior, he had got convicted for driving with a suspended license. And me thinking about how this man is going to die before getting an opportunity again to be a part of this democratic process. Um, stories like that and, and me not being able to vote for my wife, uh, that was more than enough fuel for my fire to ensure that we were successful with uh, our Amendment 4 efforts in 2018. And you were successful. Uh, a statewide vote like that requires a 60% threshold for approval. You exceeded that, got almost 65%. Um, and so that was the largest rights um, restoration in, you know, in this state's history. And it, and it brought to an end 150 years of laws that were established under Jim Crow with the specific goal of discriminating against black voters in Florida. Well, listen, first of all, we blew it out the water, right? And, 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 and let me be honest, you know, it was the largest expansion, right, of voting rights in the entire country, right, in the last 50 years, you know, uh, prior to that happening. And so this was huge and it, go, it went beyond Florida. And uh, I think what was so uh, telling about it was that it also inspired other states or folks in other states uh, to expand voting rights, whether it was in Wisconsin um, and New Mexico last year. Uh, we've seen it in North Carolina, in California, in Louisiana. And so it was a, a, a watershed moment in, in 2018. And, but the most beautiful thing about that moment was that we were able to accomplish that, not by stoking people's fears or, or their, their anger, but rather by just uh, uh, um, capturing, you know, that feeling of, of love, forgiveness, and redemption, and let that be our driving force. The, um, there is an exception to this rights restoration. It automated rights restoration, this, this amendment, um, 
there was an exception for people who were convicted of sex offenses or murder. Um, but everybody else and, and most of the people prior to Amendment 4, you know, were denied their voting rights restoration because of nonviolent drug offenses, we should say. Um, but this is an important matter. It's not just voting. It's also who makes up the, the roles of federal court juries. So federal courts, when they're selecting juries, they use voter roles to pick that pool. And that also matters in terms of the criminal justice system. Well, in Florida and even in the um, state courts, uh, you cannot, once you are convicted of a felony offense, and that's any felony offense, so it could be as simple as driving with a suspended license, or you know what, catching a lobster whose tail is too short, or even trespassing uh, on a construction site, or my favorite, releasing helium-filled balloons in the air, that's enough to get you a felony conviction in Florida. And if you do, if you are convicted, you cannot serve on a jury until your civil rights have been restored. And so at its, at its height, Florida had over 1.68 million people, right? Uh, people who served our country uh, um, in the military, you know, teachers, uh, uh, lawyers, doctors, you know, all kinds of folks from all walks of life who because they made one mistake could no longer even serve on a jury, run for office, or even vote. And so it was it was much widespread and, and it was even more uh, 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 pronounced right in our state criminal system or our state legal system. This was um, automated, as we say, the, the voting rights restoration through this amendment as it passed. Um, prior to, there was a mechanism to get your rights back, your voting rights back. It had to go basically to a clemency board. The governor had to sign off on it. Um, but it really was stymied for a number of years. Um, under Governor Charlie Crist at the time, he'd restored 155,000 people's voting rights. Um, but under Governor Rick Scott, that dwindled to just 3,000. And most of those, uh, three times as many, were you know white former offenders than black former and let, offenders. Yeah, and let, let, let's be clear. That was eight years of Governor Rick Scott's administration. Uh, Charlie Chris, in his four years, uh, you've seen 155,000 people. Prior to that, even Governor Jeb Bush, uh, in his four years, had over 75,000 people have their civil rights restored. But under the eight years of, of Governor Rick Scott, uh, you've seen only 3,000 people have their rights restored. And then with our current governor, uh, God knows that number is even far less than that. And so we've seen the process of, of, of having the clemency board restore uh, individuals' rights was purely arbitrary. And, and there was no rhyme or reason uh, in how they were restoring people or granting requests to have your know, civil rights restored. As a matter of fact, if you can remember, it took me a while. You know, here I am, uh, my organization last year was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. You, you mentioned that I was uh, to one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential in the World. I was Floridian of the Year, Central Floridian of the Year, right? Obtained a law degree, and I still had to struggle to get my civil rights restored, right? And so if there's, if there's no rhyme and reason, that leaves so much room for partisan politics to ha play a heavy role in determining which American citizen get to vote and which American citizen don't get to vote. And that was something that was very scary to us and, and, and one of the reasons that prompted us to launch this citizens initiative because something as valuable and sacred as being able to vote should not be controlled by any politician, whether they're Democrat, Republican, Independent, or any other kind of political party. No politician should have that much control in determining what, what, which American citizen get to vote and which American citizen do not get to vote. We can get in a minute to what subsequently happened after that amendment was approved was approved by voters and sort of the stumbling blocks that it's been hitting in courts and in the political world. Um, but I want to remind listeners, we're talking with voter activist Desmond Mead ahead of his appearance tonight at the TEDx Jacksonville Democracy Salon. He's uh, also going to be joined by Will Brown, reporter with Jacksonville Today. You can join our conversation live on the air by calling 904-549-2937. You can also email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org, or you can reach out on social media I want to bring in Will Brown to this conversation. Will, along with Desmond, you are one of four speakers at tonight's TEDx event. 
And you're coming at this from a little bit of a different perspective, not as an activist, but as a journalist. Correct. Um, and, you know, I did want to say Desmond says he's an extraordinary person, but I would disagree. I'd say he's a very ex extraordinary uh, because he's a living testimony. So I did want to say that. But what I am coming from is as someone who's a native Floridian and a journalist, and I'm discussing how you people can learn lessons about democracy through the lessons that we all learned playing youth sports. And we should say you have a, a long background in reporting. You worked for the Jacksonville Business Journal. You've covered logistics. You've covered business. But you also have your roots uh, as a young reporter at the Tallahassee Democrat doing sports. Yes. That's been a big passion of yours, continues to be. It continues to be. I've, I've always loved sports. I learned to multiply by watching football. So uh, I learned counting and division, multiplication and division through, through baseball statistics. So I've always been passionate about sports. And... Sports is a way that connects us. You know, there are tens of thousands of kids who play Little League Baseball in this state. You know who also played Little League Baseball? Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis was a fabulous baseball player. He played in the Little League World Series. So the lessons that people learn about sportsmanship are lessons that we all learn. And I called DeSantis out. It's not calling him out, but he was a fabulous baseball player. And so the, the Little League motto that I mentioned, that I recited when I was a 12-year-old Little League player was the same motto that DeSantis mentioned, the same motto that today's Little Leaguers mentioned. What is that motto? Uh, you know, I, it's been a couple It's been a couple, <laughs> Sorry, de okay, don't mean to call a couple you out decades. On that. But why is it that you found sport, uh, sports a useful lens to talk about strengthening democracy? Because in sports, people acknowledge that they lost. Um, you know, we earlier this hour, we, we were mentioning Coco Goff, but, you know, she played in the French Open yesterday and she won 6-3, 6-4. But if she would have lost, she wouldn't have said the game was rigged. She wouldn't have said, oh, well, my opponent cheated. She would have said, I didn't have it today. My opponent was better. And that is something that politicians of all parties can learn to, to emulate. Uh, and so that was one thing I really focused on is accepting that someone might be better than you on a given day because that is something children are taught from the time they're six, seven, eight years old. So you have framed your TED Talk presentation with kind of four primary sports um, metaphors, if you will, or, or analogies. Run us through those four. The first one is losing stinks. Accept it. It happens. Um, you, you know, a, another one was uh, a second uh, one of those what, well, let me go back. Um, oh, here we go. Sportsmanship is not weakness. Okay. You know, it's okay to to help your opponent up. It's okay to to be highly competitive while you know a acknowledging your opponent's presence. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of that in, pol in electoral politics. You know, it's so so that's but that's something that children are taught at a young age. Um, and just to pause on that for a minute, I mean, what does sportsmanship mean to you? What should it mean to us? You know, um, I, I, I think of, uh, I, was, I was not old, yet old enough to vote, but I think about in 1994 when Lawton Childs beat Jeb Bush to win the gubernatorial election. And they just happened to be in the same spot about 48 hours later. And Bush went up to Childs and congratulated him and said, I wish you success. Essentially, your success is our success. That wouldn't happen today. And so, to me, sportsmanship is competing to be the best you can be. And if someone's better than you, shake their hand and keep it moving. Mm -hmm. So you have losing stinks, accept it. Sportsmanship is not weakness. Um, what is another one of the four that you're discussing tonight? Past history does not guarantee future success. Mm. And I went down some rabbit holes because Desmond was earlier speaking about uh, voting rights and 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 how it was it put into the Florida Constitution and so that was it, it was literally put into the 1885 Florida Constitution um, I, I just looked it up it was section 6 article 4 of the Florida 1885 Florida Constitution that said people who were convicted of a felony cannot vote and it was very vague about who of what who would have constituted a felony um, Everything in that past history doesn't guarantee future success. It's, you know, I mentioned Florida State University um, and how that university was not really well known until it got a football program. And then all of a sudden it's well known all across the country. It's a dynasty. It's a dynasty. And so, but also in the terms of Florida State where, hey, they probably should have had a chance to play for a national championship last year, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to accept that. And that's not something that we often see um, in our nationalized politics or our big, 
you know, Senate races and presidential races. We, we still sometimes see it. We still see it at the local level. or it, I've seen it at the local level, and I'm sure you have as well, where people acknowledge their opponent. But we don't see that as much at the bigger levels. I want to get to your fourth in just a second, but I want to take a call or two here. Um, we've got Mark on the west side. Good morning, Mark. Go ahead. Good morning. I hate to rain on your guys' parade, but, you know, you, we hear – we hear this all the time, and we're all, it's almost it, – it's taken as given that uh, you know, sports is good for our youth, and uh, it teaches them you know, leadership and how to get along. And, I, I, and you know, we kind of accept that, and I don't think that's true at all. I think maybe the opposite is true. Um, I remember uh, a million years ago when I was uh, going for a criminal justice major, I, I asked this very que- – I got to an end at the uh, – intake on a Saturday night at the sheriff's office, and I asked that specific question of everybody that was coming through that door, did you have uh, did you, uh, any involvement in sports, you know, high school, whatever, and it, it, my, my professor at the time was wondering about my methodology because it was a hundred percent of these people that were in there for spouse abuse and DUI and everything in between wasn't, hadn't been involved in sports, and I, back then at the time, I I said, see, this is this is not, and you know, all the corruption that that's associated with big money sports. I mean, I, you know, people. I, I to this day, to this day, when I was ten years old, my uh, and I played youth sports all my life, and then, but when I was ten years old, I had an adult man bring me in front of my team of my peers and say I was the worst player on the team, and he did this. It wasn't just me; he would do this on a weekly basis. I mean, that today that that sticks with me. Yeah, Mark, I mean, it's a it's a it's a good point. Um, and obviously, there's a, somewhat of a difference between youth sports and, and professional sports. Massive but difference. You, I guess, are focusing more on the idealized version of what sports could should be. Yes, yes, um, really focusing on youth and community sports for that reason. Because, and I and I mentioned uh, the caller mentioned like that big sports has become something totally different and and i'm not disagreeing with them at all I, i'm talking about the lessons that are learned in youth sports um one thing i mentioned in my uh speech in my speech is i think it was eight or not seven or eight years old and after a game we lost and i said bad game to my opponents walter and sheila brown were not having that <laughs> the mom and dad <laughs> they shut it all down and they said you will never do that again you will you they might beat you but you will never say bad game again I can't remember a lot of things I did playing soccer, but I can remember when they got me right together uh, about what about how I would um, lose with grace. Oh, well, it sort of speaks to the fact that that kind of reaction really is childish at its at its base, right? It really does require some intellectual and emotional maturity to accept a defeat with grace. Yes, uh, and and it's the the lessons that my parents taught me are the lessons I'm now teaching my third grader uh, last week of third grade. Um, his, is, you know, he goes to fencing lessons and has fence and is about to have a fencing tournament. And it's like, buddy, you're not going to win all the time, but you have to keep trying. You have to keep pushing yourself. And those, that's what I'm really talking about, about how, if, if you push yourself, if you try, if you, if you take those lessons, that's what from youth sports and community sports, you'll, it will serve, it will serve you well. And the politicians uh, at the national level would be well served to remember those lessons as well. I want to take a call from our buddy Stanley on the north side. Good morning, Stanley. Go ahead. Good morning. Great job here. I will. I'm going to have to push back, too, because I, I disagree when I have to come to seeing this, when it comes to African Americans, that's the only thing we can do. And I have a problem with that because that's not true. Why are you not talking about STEAM or STEM technology, the things of the future for the youth? Because they can compete in that category and develop uh, sportsmanship through that too. But I'm, I see this, it's the same thing as the caller just said. The same thing, especially when it comes to the African American community. Thank you. Thanks, Stanley. I also want to take a call from Ted in Green Cove Springs. Good morning, Ted. Go ahead. Yes, I'm going to agree with your guest and disagree with the caller who were criticizing uh, team sports. Uh, my son uh, have played soccer and football all the way through the end of high school about 10 years ago. And some of his best friends were African-Americans, teammates. They don't look at each other from, from race. 
or from religion or from ethnicity. They were teammates, and they 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 back each other. Ted, I think we might have lost you. Um, I want to steer back to Desmond just for a minute because we talked about the success of Amendment Four, Desmond, <clears throat> um, and yet almost immediately there was some political pushback on that. And the governor signed uh, a law the next year that required additional um, actions be taken before somebody could have their rights restored. And that primarily was satisfying any fines or fees or debts that they had um, prior to being eligible for that rights restoration. Yes, yes it did. Uh, but here, here's the thing though, right? I think the pushback really came from politicians. And, and, and I want to be very clear with that. It was totally different than who we seen come out to actually support Amendment 4. Over 5.1 million people voted yes, right? And that was a million more people, over a million more people voted for our initiative than for our governor, right? And on top of that, we had over a million people who voted for our initiative that were uh, uh, registered Republicans, right? And and so I, I, I like to tout that because it really showed that no, we can bring people together, right? That that listen, that even though like like that first caller when he said, right, "Well, I hate to rain on your parade," and in my head I'm like, "Bro, you're not raining on on anybody's parade. If anything, you bring a little sunshine right to our conversation because you bring in light to our conversation. You bring a different perspective to our conversation, and there may be some things that we we may not have experienced or even considered, but because of your input, we now have a more vibrant." conversation and the more uh, a, a vibrant approach to solving our issues. And that's what we've seen with Amendment 4. That, that listen, we had people that were conservative, progressive, young, old, uh, 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 Latinx, uh, 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 white or black, uh, uh, different religions that came together. We had over 870 congregations of faith, whether they were conservative uh, Christians, whether they were African-American clergy, whether they were conservative Latino evangelicals, whether they were uh, 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 Muslims or whether they were Jewish, uh, people of Jewish faith, they all came together, right, with saying, let my people vote. They all came together saying yes to second chances. Now, there's so many things that we may differ on but man, there are some key core values that we do agree on, and those are the values that drove us. But when we crossed the finish line successfully, then the politics came into play, and that is the problem, right? It is, it is how politics have progressed that caused people who would agree on so many things to all of a sudden now think that we have to fight each other over every issue, over every nuance of our conversation. And that is not who we are as a people, because no one wants to wake up next to a neighbor that he's scared of or hates, right? That deep down inside, we do want to be able to live in community in spite of our differences, right? Whether you went to Florida State or you went to University of Florida, or whether you went to Alabama or Auburn, you know, in spite of our differences, there's so much more that can bring us together. And if we can somehow or another figure out how to remove politics, right, from our discourse and, 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 and engage in, in, in conversations around the things that identify us and connect us along the lines of humanity. There's so much more that we can accomplish in this great state of Florida, uh, so much more that we can accomplish in, in our country or even in the world. In terms of having, you know, diverse support for this, uh, this amendment, this when it passed, I mean, you had support from the Koch brothers, which are, you know, very kind of considered pretty far to the right in terms of the financing, the issues that they typically tackle. You also had support from the ACLU, so it was a pretty broad spectrum. And yet um, this new requirement that fees and fines be satisfied has been difficult. And we should say it's because there really is no central repository for that information. So if somebody's released from prison, they don't have a tally somewhere on a court docket or in their personal file that they can just say, oh, I owe this much to this person or that court and satisfy it. Um, so you well, shifted. Listen, let me be, Go ahead. Yeah, let me be very clear with this, right? There is no legitimate reason for erecting obstacles uh, that prevent people from participating in our democracy. 
right? The more people we have participating in our democracy, the more vibrant our democracy becomes. And our motivation for expanding democracy is not based on how people may vote or how people may think, or whether or not people like us or not. We fought just as hard for that person that wanted to vote for Donald Trump as we did for that person who wished they could have voted for Barack Obama. We want to make sure that every a citizen have an opportunity to be engaged in this process. And I think it's very important to understand that, um, that folks need to know that this was more universal. And actually, to be totally honest with you, I, know I really do believe that our democracy and, and the right to vote is less political than people are making it today. You have shifted gears, though, somewhat, your organization, um, because of this challenge, to finding funds for people to satisfy and, and to helping them pay off those debts. And you've had some really prominent folks make donations to that effort. Yeah, we had, we had a couple of stars, you know, like LeBron uh, James, Michael Jordan, Ariana Grande, uh, people like Rihanna, um, uh, Haley Bieber's just, uh, I mean, I remember when we, we, we started the fundraising campaign, we had over 90,000 Americans, 90,000 people that donated uh, to our fines and fees fund to help folks uh, pay off their fines and fees. But we also, in addition to that, we challenged the state of Florida. We're like, wait a minute. Now, if you're telling us that we have to pay fines and fees uh, 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 prior to being able to vote, then you got to be in a position to be able to tell us what fines and fees we owe. Uh, so we can't take care of this responsibility that you're placing on us. And if you can't tell us that, then we got some problems that we need to talk about. You know, and so we were attacking it from various angles, either uh, uh, through trying to work with the state to create a better system, uh, through raising money to help people who are too poor to 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 pay their fines and fees, and and of course, no American citizen should be forced to choose between paying their mortgage or rent or putting food on their table or being able to vote. You know, voting should be. Uh, freely accessible to every qualified American citizen in this country, and, and, and we're going to continue fighting for that. And then, of course, we have the courts that we can use as well to uh, encourage uh, to get encourage our judicial system to either waive those fines and fees or convert those fines and fees to community service hours and allow a person the ability to be able to participate in our, in our uh, democracy. Will Brown, um, we didn't get to all four of yours, but you are going to be there tonight. So this event not only has um, the speeches that you'll be giving, um, also there's a presentation by uh, two other speakers. Hope McMath is one of them. Um, Ramon Perez is the other. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and then you'll be answering questions and having some breakouts with people there. Um, so this is a, an event to talk about democracy, but it's, yes. it's, there's going to be some breakout discussions. I talked to the organizers today. There's only 10 tickets left. So if people are interested, they do have to buy them online by 3 o'clock today. But I know you're looking forward to this. I am super looking forward to it. The fourth lesson is information is more important than news. And um, where I, this is a, I specifically say that democracy survives with people actively choosing information and applying it. And that would be akin to leaving your house on a Friday night, going to a high school football game, and paying for a reserve ticket at midfield. You have to apply the information once you get it. Well, we are looking forward to your uh, presentation tonight, Will, um, Desmond Mead as well. Thank you so much for joining us and um, talking about your efforts to preserve democracy and advice for all of us that we can take and uh, learn from. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.